<clears throat> All right. Well, it is good to be with you guys. My name is Matt Carter. For those of you who've been uh, or just started coming to the church over the last couple of months, I'm the uh, founding pastor of the Austin Stone. Started the church about 10 years ago with my wife, Jennifer. And I currently serve here as an elder, as pastor of preaching and vision. I've been out of the pulpit for a couple of months during the summer. A lot of people think that I have been on sabbatical this summer. I have not. I've actually been getting my doctorate, working on my doctorate. I'm going to uh, get my doctorate in expositional preaching uh, at Southeastern Seminary. I have not gotten it yet, but um, it's been one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. We've got a lot of college students here at the Austin Stone. And after I graduated my, with my master's back in uh, 2006, I used to kind of gloat about the fact that I would never write a paper again. I would see Jesus face to face before I'd write a paper again. And that has been proven wrong. And uh, I've been writing a lot of papers. And it's hit me that when I'm done, my title is going to be Dr. Carter, which I never thought would happen in my whole life. And a lot of people have been asking me, they're like, Matt, are you going to ask people to call you Dr. Carter? And uh, the answer to that is I'm not. You guys, you guys can continue to call me Matt. I am, though, making a list of people on staff that I am going to require to call me Dr. Carter. <laughs> and I'm up to three right now. And uh, two of those are on our youth ministry team. And I'll, I'll tell you more about that at another time. But uh, we're teaching through the gospel of Mark. We're jumping back into Mark. <clears throat> As Jeff shared last week, that we teach verse by verse, word by word through the scriptures. And the reason that we do that as a church, because we believe with all our hearts that there is one thing and one thing alone that has the power to change a human life, and that is the Holy Spirit inspired word of God. My words, my thoughts, my stories, my intellect, my humor, it, it does not have the power to change your heart. But the Word of God does, and so that's why we preach the Bible here at this church. And so in light of that, let's open up our Bibles today to Mark chapter 4, verse 1. If you don't have a copy of the Scriptures, that's okay. We're going to have them on the screen behind us. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. We come today to what's called the parable of the sower. <clears throat> it's the parable of the sower. You may have heard that taught on if you've spent any time in church. It's the parable of the sower. And a lot of times when Jesus would draw a crowd, and he was doing that at this point in the story, he's drawn a crowd, he's drawn a large crowd. <clears throat> and when he would do that, he would teach in what was called a parable. He would stand up and teach the crowd, and he would teach them uh, a parable, basically a story that has a meaning. And that's what he kind of does today. Uh, it's called the parable of the sower. Now listen to this. I'm going to teach next week on what the parable of the sower actually means, because Jesus reveals it to his disciples, what the parable of the sower means. But today what I'm going to do is we're just going to look at one thing. We're going to answer the question. It's a very important question. We're going to answer the question, why did Jesus speak in parables? Why did Jesus speak in parables? And you, you hear that and you think, oh, that doesn't sound very interesting. Uh, that's not a big deal. But the fact of the matter is it's a, it's a huge deal why Jesus spoke in parables. Now, my guess is that the vast majority of us in this room right now, if not everybody in this room right now, has never once in their whole lives heard a message on the verses that I'm going to preach from today. And I say that because, again, I'm, I'm, I've gone through my whole life being a Baptist and went to seminary and going back to seminary and spent my whole life in church, and I've never once heard a preacher stand up and preach the verses that we're going to preach today. And the reason I think that is, is because today when Jesus explains to us why he teaches in parables, it is one of the hardest verses in the whole Bible. It might be the hardest verse to swallow in the entire scripture. It's one of those verses that you read it and you go, I, it, did, did Jesus just say that? Let me go take a break. You come back. Did he really just say that? That doesn't sound like the Jesus I grew up with in Sunday school. Did he, Hallam, did he really say that? Yes, that's what he said. And the reason you've never heard this verse preached, the vast majority of us in the room, is because preachers are scared to death to preach this verse. It's right in the middle of the parable of the sower. Jesus kind of drops this bomb, and you go, what? What did he just say? And then they just skip over it because they're scared to death. But here's the thing today. I ain't scared, all right? And so I'm going to jump into it. Let's do it. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. It says, he began to teach again by the sea. 
And such a very large crowd gathered to him. And he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And so if you can imagine, if you were here a while back when we taught through the From Israel series, you can see the the Sea of Galilee in your mind and the hills come up from the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is attracting this really large crowd and the crowd has gotten so big at this point that he gets out into a boat a little ways off of the shore there and he sits down in the boat and he starts teaching to the crowd that's up the hill there on the Sea of Galilee. Look at verse 2. It says, and he was teaching them many things in parables. The crowd would show up, and then as he taught, he taught them the Word of God in parables. Now, church, let me ask you a question. Up to kind of this point in your life, why do you think that Jesus taught in parables? Why do you do so? The the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the sower, the parable of the lost son. Why did Jesus, when he stood up in front of the crowds, why would he just tell a story that had this kind of meaning that was essentially hidden? Why did he do that? Um, A lot of people I've heard say over the years, a lot of preachers I've heard say over the years that the reason that Jesus taught in stories is because that was the most effective way to communicate a truth. I've actually had pastors say that they just teach in stories because Jesus just taught in stories because that's a really effective way to communicate a truth. I've heard uh, pastors and I've heard people say that Jesus taught in parables because Jesus wanted to be simplistic in his teaching. Listen, He wanted to be simplistic in his teaching so that everybody could understand it and the story. And that's why he taught his stories. He didn't want to get into theology and things like that. He just wanted people to be able to understand. So he taught in stories and in parables. Hear this. That can't be right. It can't be right. Those two theories as to why Jesus taught in parables. Simplicity. Ease of understanding cannot be why Jesus taught in parables. Why do I say that? Here is the answer. Watch the disciples' response after Jesus teaches the parable of the sower. Again, I'm going to go through the actual parable next week. But I want you to look at the disciples' response after Jesus teaches the parable of the sower. Look at verse 10. Mark chapter 4, verse 10. Watch the disciples' response. (coughs) In verse 10 it says, as soon as he was alone. Now he just taught it. It says, as soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. So, so he teaches the parable, he gets alone with them, the disciples start asking him about the parables. That was the typical response when Jesus taught in a parable. Their, their, their typical response after he taught a parable was not, wow, Jesus, that was an awesome story. Thank you so much for teaching in such a simplistic way that I'm able to understand everything you just taught. That's not what that, that was not their response. He would teach a parable and the disciples would pull, pull him aside after the crowds dispersed. They'd pull him aside, they'd get him along, they'd go, Jesus, cool story. What in the world did it mean? That was their response. You can just imagine that they were probably trying to look cool while Jesus was preaching it because they're the disciples for crying out loud. And so Jesus is telling this story and the disciples are sitting there going, yeah, amen. Praise. Do you hear Jesus is bringing it today? Do you hear that? He's bringing it. And then they would get done. They'd pull him aside and they say, Jesus, we have absolutely no clue what you just said. Would you please explain it to us? Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 33. This is after Jesus kind of teaches all these parables to the crowd. Mark 4, 33. Mark actually explains to us that this kind of response to the parables was the norm. Look at verse 43. With many such parables, he was speaking the word to them. With many such parables, he was speaking the word to them, (coughs) excuse me, as far as they were able to hear it. Now watch this. It says, he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. Now, let me read that one more time. In verse 34, it says, he did not speak to the crowd without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. 
All right, do you see that? He'd get up in front of a crowd. He'd preach this story that has this meaning, this parable. Nobody would have a clue as to what it was, the meaning of the parable. And then, listen, he would pull the disciples away and then he would privately, only to them, explain the meaning of the story, only to the disciples. Now, if Jesus, here we, here we go here, if Jesus told parables because he wanted to teach simplistically so that everybody could understand, then why did he only reveal the true meaning of the word of God to his disciples privately? Okay, why did he not reveal the true meaning of the parable publicly to the crowds? Verses 9 through 11 gives us the answer. Look at verse, actually 9 through 12, but let's look at 9 through 11 for a second. Verse, uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 9. Jesus has just finished completing the parable of the sower here. <clears throat> he, he stops, and this is his final statement that he says to the crowd here. At the, in verse 9, he says, And he was saying, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's an interesting way to end a sermon. He who has ears to hear. Let him hear. In other words, there's everybody in the room here has got a pair of ears. But he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then in verse 10, he says, as soon as he was alone, and we've read this, as soon as he was alone, his followers along with the 12 began asking him about the parables. Look at verse 11. And he said to them, disciples, to you has been given, underline that if you got a copy of the scripture today, or you take your notes right there, to you disciples has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside get everything in parables. Jesus, what in the world did that parable mean? Boys, to you, I'm going to give you the mystery of the kingdom of God. Everybody else just gets parables. And then in the very next sentence, he starts explaining the parable to them privately. Now, the key word there in that phrase is given. Jesus says, disciples, I'm going to give you the meaning. In other words, Jesus says, boys, I am choosing privately to reveal to you the meaning of the word of God. But everybody else, I'm not going to reveal to them the meaning of the word of God. And in the very next verse, he says why some people get revealed the truth of the word of God and why some people just get parables. And by the way, this is the verse everybody skips over. Nobody preaches because it might be the hardest verse in the whole Bible to stomach. Look at verse 11 again. And he said to them, disciples to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. Jesus in verse 12 says why. He says, so that. Here's why I'm doing that. Here's why I'm revealing to you the secret of the kingdom of God, disciples. And here's why everybody else in the crowd is just getting the parables without me revealing the secret of the kingdom of God. Verse 12, so that they, that's the crowd, they may indeed see but not perceive. And may indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven. Now, you just read that probably for the first time in a long time. I want you to take a second, and I want you to read verse 11 again. Jesus says, I'm giving you, boys, the, the, the secret. I'm giving you the secret to the mysteries of the kingdom of God. To everybody else, I'm teaching them in parables so that they may indeed see, but they're not going to perceive. So they may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. I want you to take just a second read verse 11 by yourself. Paul M. Sa and I looked at this for the very first time a year ago. And um, when we were reading it, Paul M. a really intelligent guy, by the way. Paul M. Uh, one of our pastors preaching, probably the smartest guy I've ever met. And I'm reading through this, and I said, Paul M., I've never heard anybody preach that verse. And uh, he said, me neither. And I said, does that mean what I think it means? And he said, yeah, it does. And we were so scared to preach it, we put it off a year. 
And we've been arguing for a year who, who got to preach this verse. Um, Jeff, Tyler, David, me, Harlem, we've been studying this verse for a year. Going, does this mean what, what I think it means here? Because here's what Jesus just said to his disciples. He said, to you, I am revealing the meaning of these parables because I'm revealing to you the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But I speak in parables to everybody else because I am choosing to not let them understand it. And that's what it says. And if you don't believe me that that is what Jesus is saying, you go to the gospel of Matthew and the very same story in the gospel of Matthew, Matthew the parable of the sower. And in, uh, don't turn there, just listen. Matthew chapter 13, verse 10, this is, this is what it says. It just comes right out and tells you that that's what the verse means. And, and this is after the parable of the sower. He says, and the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak in parables? That's a pretty straightforward answer to the question we're about to get. Jesus, you just told the story and then just jetted. Why do you, Jesus, speak in parables? Watch the answer Jesus gives. Matthew 13, 11, Jesus answered them and said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Straightforward. Jesus says, I'm choosing to reveal the meaning of the word of God to you. I am choosing not to reveal the meaning of the word of God to them. That's what he says. Here's the whole point of the sermon today. If you believe the gospel today, if you believe the gospel today, if you're sitting here in this room and you believe the truth of the gospel today, it is because you have been granted by the Lord to know the gospel today. If you believe the gospel today, if you believe the truth of the gospel today, it is because that truth has been revealed to you by the Lord. I, I, matter of fact, let's just kind of prove this here. If, if I'm going to make a really, I'm going to make an outlandish statement to you. I'm going to make a statement that, that, that's so nuts that the vast majority of the world is going to think it's moronic if they were to hear it. Are you ready for this? I'm, this, this statement is just downright crazy what I'm about to make. Y'all ready for this? It's a, it's a moronic, crazy statement. You ready? And I say moronic because the Bible calls it moronic for those who are perishing, so don't email me. Um, but this is, this is a statement. You ready for this crazy statement? There's a God. He created uh, the whole world. He created the universe created us, but we sinned. He's perfect, and we sinned, and we fell short of his glory, and so he kicked us out of the Garden of Eden, and, but he didn't leave us there. He actually came to earth. God did. And he wasn't born just the way that all the rest of us were born. He was born actually of a virgin. He was born of a virgin, and when he came, he lived 33 years on this earth, and he never sinned once. He lived a perfect life. And after he had never sinned, he'd never done anything wrong, we, his creation, put him, picked him up, and nailed some nails in his arms and his feet on a cross. And he hung there for six hours on a Friday, and then this God who became flesh died. And then not only did he die, but we actually buried him. The God who created heaven and earth and the universe was buried in a tomb and he stayed there for three days. And then after three days, he came back to life. He came back to life. He came out of the grave and then he appeared to all the people that knew him before he died and then he ascended. Just poof. Back up where right now he sits on his throne reigning over everything all of creation if you believe that truth today if that crazy statement if you hear that and everything inside of you screams out that is the truth it is because the Lord the scripture is clear it is because the Lord has revealed that truth to you you did not come to that truth through an intellectual ascent you did not come to believe that truth because you're smarter than everybody that doesn't believe the truth. You came to that truth because God in his kindness and his grace looked at you and revealed the truth, the mystery of the kingdom of God to you. It is by grace we have been saved. 
Jesus just comes right out and says, that's how you found out about it. In, in Matthew chapter, don't turn there, Matthew chapter 16, verse 14. You've heard this before. Jesus looks at the disciples in, in verse 14 and he says, he says, uh, or rather, he, he says, who, who, who do people say that I am? He asked them the question, the disciples, hey, who's everybody? What are they saying about me? Who do they say that I am? And the disciples responded to verse 14. Then they said, some say you're John the Baptist and others say you're Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. In other words, the point is this, is that everybody else had it wrong. Everybody else didn't believe Jesus was who he really was. They're like, oh, you're John the Baptist, you're Elijah, you're, you're just one of the prophets, you're Jeremiah. And then he looks at his disciples and says, okay, boys, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds in verse 16, it says, Simon Peter answered, and he said, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. In other words, you are Jesus, you're the Messiah, and not only you're the Messiah, you're not just the one we've been looking for for all this time. You're not just the one that the Old Testament prophets have spoken of. Peter said, you are the Son of the living God. In other words, Jesus, you are God. And he doesn't look at Peter there and say, wow, Peter, you're really smart. Man, out of all the people that study the Bible every day, the Pharisees, you're obviously smarter than them. Peter, wow, you, you, just, you just get it. How did you, Peter, for crying out loud, you're a, you're a fisherman from the, an uneducated fisherman from the backwoods of Israel. Wow, Peter, you're so smart. Now Jesus looks at Peter in verse 17 and Jesus said to him, blessed are you. You, Peter, are blessed. Why? Simon Barjona because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But my Father who is in heaven. Jesus said, Peter, the reason you got the right answer when everybody else got it wrong is because your heavenly Father revealed the truth, the mystery of the kingdom of God to you. And some of you, um, as you hear this, you're sitting there thinking, all right, I see that, but that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem like how God would work that he chooses who he reveals himself to and who he doesn't reveal himself to. So Matt, you're sitting here saying that I can't know God unless he chooses to reveal himself to me. That actually is exactly what Jesus is saying here. But, but the truth that you can't know the Lord unless the Lord reveals himself to you is, is just the Bible expressing, listen, it's just the Bible expressing one of the most fundamental truths about God that we all get and we all operate under the same principle. And that's this, that although God is divine, although he is God, he is divine, but he is a divine person. He is a divine person. In, in church, you can't know a person unless that person chooses to let you know them. Everybody operates under that. You can know about a person, you can know about a person all day long, but you can't truly know them unless they choose to reveal their heart to you. It's like that with my wife. We have 16 year anniversary yesterday. I'm nuts about her. I want to know everything about her. I want to know her heart. I want to know her mind. I want to know her dreams. I want to know her soul. I just don't want to know, want to know the details about her. I want to know her heart, mind, and soul. But I'm going to tell you something. I cannot know her on that level unless she makes the choice as a person to reveal her heart to me. The Bible actually says this in the Greek. There's two words in the Greek New Testament for know. For knowledge, one is oida. It means to know the facts about somebody. Uh, you can have oida about, about me. You can know I'm, I'm six foot one. I have brown hair. I have blue eyes. I'm wearing skinny jeans right now. There's a lot of things that you, you can have oida about me right now. But I'm going to tell you something else. There's another word that the Bible uses to know. It's the word gnosko. It means an intimate, revealed knowledge. It means my heart, it means my soul, it means my mind. It's, it's, a, it's a, almost a sexual term in the Greek there. It's a deep, intimate knowing. 
It's to know my soul. It's to know my heart. It's to know who I truly am. I'm going to tell you something. You can have oida about me all day long, but to gnosko me, I've got to let you gnosko me. We get that. And that's all in the world Jesus is saying here. He's a person. He's got to let you know him. Matthew 13, 11, Jesus answered to them, to you, boys, it has been granted to know. There's the word. To know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them it has not been granted. We cannot know the Lord unless he reveals himself to our hearts. There's a couple of quick, we're done here. There's a couple of quick implications to this truth today. There's a lot of them I'm going to talk about too. We're done. Here's the implication of the truth that the Lord reveals. He's got to reveal himself to you. Implication number one, believers, there's a lot of you in this room that you need to lay down your guilt that you're, you're feeling and experiencing because you have loved ones in your life that have not trusted in Christ. You've presented the gospel to them and they have not responded and you're carrying a lot of guilt because they won't turn and you need to let that guilt go in light of what the scripture's saying today. Your job is to be a sower of the seed of the word of God. Your job, your calling, because you have been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Your job is to sow the seed, to preach the gospel. It's been revealed to you, preach the gospel. But church, it is God's job to reveal himself to the hearts of men. You cannot reveal him to somebody's heart. Only God can do that. I was a kid, I was in my youth ministry a long time ago when I was a youth pastor, and he was an atheist. And uh, I just had a heart for this kid. And started spending a lot of time with him and started witnessing to him and witnessing to him and witnessing to him. And I would tell him basically, the, and, and just doing everything I know to do, apologetics and praying and and yelling and, and begging and just to come to Jesus. And, and I, would, I would say, man, this, I just believe this is the truth that Jesus is who he says he was. He's changed my life. And, 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 and man, just, just pray to him. And, and then he would just smart off to me and say stuff like, yeah, dude, let's just go out in the woods and pray to the fairies and the gnomes too. It was just stupid to him. And I watched as the guy rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected the truth and his life completely fell apart beyond <laughs> my ability to even convey it. And uh, never trusted the Lord. And I just carried a huge amount of guilt for years that I couldn't convince this guy to follow the Lord. And the, the weight of all this was lifted off me when I realized that it was, it was my job, it's my calling, because the Lord had revealed it to me, it's my calling to be faithful to present the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it was the Lord's, it's the Lord's job, if you will, to reveal that truth to his heart, okay? I don't reveal the truth of who God is to a human heart, only the Lord does. And so today, if you're living in guilt because you've got a loved one, a mother, a father, or a child, or a brother, or a sister, or a coworker that you've been witnessing to, and they are rejecting it, you just need to let that go. Keep presenting the gospel, but you've got to let go of the guilt and trust their hearts to the Lord. Jesus promises us that his sheep are going to hear his voice. You present the voice. You trust their hearts to the Lord. Second implication of this verse is this. If you're a believer today, this truth ought to blow your mind. <laughs> if you stop for just a second and you think about this truth, that, that I believe today the most important truth in the universe I believe the most important truth in the universe. I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and the reason that I believe it is because I'm blessed by the Father and he has revealed it to me. If that right there does not produce worship in your heart, I don't know what will. That when I was dead in my trespasses and in my sins, Jesus reached down. He made me alive together with Christ. It's by grace I am saved, not of works, that any man should boast. I have, a, I have a friend of mine, he's a pastor of one of the, probably the top five biggest churches in Chicago. 
And uh, their motto of their church makes me cringe when I hear it. And I'm outed now publicly. He's going to know. But the motto of their church is so-and-so church, helping people find their way back to God. Helping people find their way back to God. And I hear it and I cringe. Because the scripture is clear. And Luke, don't turn there, just watch this. Luke 15, 4, Jesus is speaking here. He says, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. For when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Let me tell you something, church. If you are in Christ Jesus today, you did not find God. God found you. God found you. And so if you're not a believer here today, I want to challenge you, I want to encourage you to pray a very bold and courageous prayer. Lord, if you're real, would you reveal yourself to me? Would you let me know you? And if you're a believer here today, I want you to remember this. I want you to let that sink in for just a second. The king of the universe (laughs) has revealed himself to you. He has revealed the gospel in your heart and you're going to spend eternity in heaven because God let you know him. Let's pray. You take just a second and you let the truth of that believer rest on your heart. Jesus said it himself. To you has been granted to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. How awesome is that? Let's worship now in light of the truth that we are here today, that we're saved today, not because we made some seeking intellectual ascent to the gospel, but that when we were dead, he reached down, he gave us life, he breathed the truth into our minds and our hearts and our souls, and he saved us. And let's give him the glory due his name. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for what you've done. We love you, we thank you. We don't know how to say thank you enough. I pray that you would reveal the truth of the gospel to many hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen.